become. Yes, so, now, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us to reflect quietly on our vocation. We ask our Blessed Lady to intercede for us that all the saints who have passed before us through the desert path and to glory. Good. Now, in that context, I would just like to share with you something of our roots, which are all common. I was quite moved to find this in the little, quite monastic cell that you've given me each time hitherto. It looks at me when I wake up and I look at it, <laughs> and I think that's where we're coming from. And actually, this contains it all. If you look carefully, the two are there. There he is, being formed in solitude by the Holy Spirit. There is the end product, and there is the rule. So it's all there, and we must not forget that bit, because it all starts there, in the one-to-one, -one, the eyeball-to-eyeball. -eyeball. And if that's not there, it's all on the wrong side, the outside. So it starts, basically, with the experience of what we are and what we are not. This was given to me, it was a, an abbot I knew actually, André Louf, who was Abbey of Mont Descartes, one of the great abbots in the 70s and 80s in France. And actually his prior became our abbot at La Trappe. And this was a house where they were very much aware of the monastic roots. Inside the Trappist order, Quite a lot of work was done in the 70s on the monastic route, specifically the Desert Fathers. In fact, there was one accident. It was the prior of Bellefontaine, which is the daughter house of La Trappe, who became so involved with the Eastern spirituality that he went over to Mount Athos and didn't come back. <laughs> now, therefore, this, as does much of his work, goes right to the roots. I remember when I got to La Trappe in 1970, no, 1974 was the first time I was exposed to it for a month there. I was given to read André Louf, and it was that particular volume, Seigneur, apprends-nous à prier. And it's a classic work, Teach Us to Pray, and it goes into the essence of it, what it's all about even actually on the mystical level, it's all opened up. The level of love where we espouse the other half in God, it's all there. And fairly radical, as are all things French. In fact, that's, from an early age, what pulled me into the French embryons, because I realized they had the awareness of the authenticity of the monastic life. You know that the problem in specifically Britain is that it had to adapt to history. And therefore, they took on things which had to be done, education and parishes. But in France, they were pure. And therefore, you get something of that idealism, which has its A's and B's, with regard to everything, including the monastic life. But also, unfortunately, things liturgical. Therefore, you have this extremism coming in in France. But nevertheless, there still you will find an awareness of the link between what we're doing today and where we've come from, which is where I want to land. This working there on the essence, humility, it all starts from there. If it's not there, it's all really based on sand. And this book goes, of course, into the whole notion of Benedictine spirituality, which is based on humility. And the notion of humility in Benedict is something so fundamental that if it's not there, Nothing is going to be there. The notion of the soul that knows itself is also the soul, therefore, that is available. The soul that is fully aware that it has nothing and therefore no rights. It's a soul, therefore, that's going to be in a mode of reception. In St. Benedict, that comes through right from the beginning with the very opening word of the rule. Ausculta, and that is the mode of the whole of the monk's being, that he's there not emitting but ingesting, taking in and listening, which therefore gives the whole notion then of availability on every level. The word ob audire, obedire, of course, has the root of listening in it. It also works in other languages, even in German. Gehorsam guide, it's there, isn't it? The listening is there. Gehör and all that, it's all there. So listening is the bending of the ear. And this 
then is the fundamental mode of all the monk's existence. He is bending the ear, but in this case the inner ear. Hence it is that for that to happen, we have the whole discipline of progressively excluding what is an obstacle to it. And the whole ethos of the monastery is essentially to protect that availability and therefore that simplicity and virginity. Now, that brings me to where I want to land. The fundamental basis, as I say, is this bit, that it's starting in the solitude, that desert experience where there's nothing but the one-to-one. -one. We have it right in the beginning with Paul, the first hermit, who still looked upon as the model for first hermits. Then we have Anthony, who actually wasn't aware of the existence of Paul when he came there. He was mystically made aware of it before he died and helped him when he was dying. But he then also was formed initially directly by the Holy Spirit in a solitude which was not dissimilar, getting further and further away from men and going into the heart of the desert, for a while living actually in a tomb, completely alone. And then, of course, he was discovered, as happens classically throughout monastic history, the starets, the abbas, is given this spiritual fatherhood by the Holy Spirit, and then he's able to engender souls in the Lord. So that's what happened, of course, to Antony. And then we have, coming from that, this regrouping of souls in a shared solitude, which then, of course, repeats itself as history goes on. As history goes on, it then becomes codified and regrouped again. We have still on our dathos the three basic formulae there. Some living, usually after permission, in and quite extreme solitude and inaccessibility sometimes, you've got some hermits so inaccessible that it takes them many hours to get from their hermitage on the rocks down by some kind of chain affair, down to ground level, and then back again in the evening because they have to have access now and again to the synaxis, the liturgy, over the weekend essentially. But it's so secluded that in actual fact they will not have any human contact for, I suppose, five or six days out of seven. This, then, is something which is on one end of the extreme, to be found still in certain situations. One extreme one would be the possibility still, especially in the reformed Kamaldalese, for reclusion. The intermediary stage, which you still find on our dathos, is the lavra, when you have these hermits sharing a certain amount together. That would be actually what gave rise to the Celtic formula, what we have in the roots in Ireland and in Wales, where you have cells built initially of wood around a church which eventually would be more stable and made of stone. That's coming by inspiration from the East. And there was a cross-fertilization between East and West, we know that, from early monastic history. And then, of course, in Mount Athos, you have the grand monasteries, which are then the equivalent of our Cenobitic communities as we know it, Koinos, Bios, the common life, which then was already being codified fairly early on, essentially by St. Pacomius. And then Basil, of course, becomes the father figure for all the Eastern monks in general. And he actually has a teaching that the sharing of the life is actually more challenging and superior because charity enters into it. Now, I would just like to enter into what is going on here. The whole notion of creating a situation in which there is total total availability means that therefore what we are doing is in creating a monastery where we are sharing our solitude, we are creating essentially a shared protection for our hermitage, which in that case becomes virtual. In the Trappist life, it's perceived classically as being made of an invisible enclosure called silence. Because the soul is 
in virtue of its completely, in that case, shared solitude, because everything is in common physically, then, given the possibility of having a well-cushioned and protected shared solitude, in which then there can be this pure virtual hermitage of the soul, which in the pure Trappist life, which is trying to reproduce ad literam, the Lucian Benedict, there is no diminution of intensity as regards availability. Why? Because it was perceived by the early reformers, going back to St. Benedict, of course, who is fairly actually insistent on it, that the great enemy of that is the word. But therefore, there is a whole teaching throughout the Ulus and Benedict, which was taken very seriously by the Cistercian reformers, that silence is of the essence of the solitude that we create together. Now, I just want to zoom into that specific question, because one can't do more than one theme in one conference, and one will forget things if one doesn't keep to one theme. But it is an important one, because it is one thing that the enemy of the soul, and therefore of mankind, is aware of. The monastic life functions if it is doing what it is meant to do. It has its role in the life of the church. Dans le cœur de l'Église, ma mère, je serai l'amour. In the heart of the church, my mother, I shall be love. Now, therefore, it is a mystical presence, but it is the heart of the church. It has to be doing what it's there for. It has a real role. And authors have had strong words regarding the role of the monastic life to the effect that woe for the world if it were not for monks. That is, if these places, these paratonnerres, these places where the lightning is taken in against, therefore, the flood, if they weren't there, the world would collapse. But there is this mystical element of actually upholding the world, upholding the balance between evil and good by taking on what is due for the planet. Therefore, there is a real role in the mystical body and in humanity for souls who are doing just that and also who are gratuitously engaged in what the angels are engaged in in heaven. They are a public role of praise all the time, which is actually your case specifically with perpetual adoration. Now, what the problem is this. The devil knows full well that if he can in some way inquinate the purity of the virgin atmosphere of a contemplative monastery, he is going to take away from the church a great instrument of harm to himself. He hates places of contemplative prayer. So he's going all the time to be trying to make it such that they're not what they are. Paul VI, after the council, was trying to warn people around the church when applying renewal to be what they were not to look over their shoulders to what was happening elsewhere and imitate it and by osmosis to become just like a bit of everything else. There was a specificity in the vocation. Now, the devil knows full well that silence is very fragile. It is always the weaker member in a partnership. Put two brothers or sisters together or a group together and one in the midst who is fairly verbose all suffer the consequences, not just the verbose, verbose one. Multiply that by a monastery and you see the danger. Now, in practice, this was perceived for what it was as a fundamental issue with consequences in the years following the Council, specifically in the Trappist reform. In the general chapter of 1971, the Abbas General were united in chapter deciding how to apply the renewal, and it was perceived that there was a double pull. That coming from the very quickly expanded American bloc, which had had a boom after the war of vocations, and also a great author 
Father Louis Thomas Merton, who had popularized things and attracted vocations by his writings, and they had found it very quickly from house to house. They had made new foundations, often with people prepared in a fairly short time, which meant that when it came to the application of things in the early 70s, they were a little bit further removed from the roots they had in France. So what was happening was that there was this double thrust. One in America, with the exception of one or two big houses, but on the whole it was going a bit that way, to have something a bit more Cistercian than Benedictine, but Benedictine in, in inclination, and the French, which were still fairly aware of where they were coming from. And the abbot general at the time was Don Ignace Gillet, and he saw exactly what was happening. They were voting in things like what was referred to as the permission to have brief communications, the communication brève, without permission. And the question then, they could see that that was the wedge, where that was going to lead to. When I was there, actually, we were still being taught the sign language. This is already still in the, certainly in the 70s, and certainly still in the 80s, we were still being taught the sign language, at least at La Trappe. But we were seeing what was going on elsewhere. Now, Don Ignace was quite concerned because he, see, he could see, as Abbot General, with the global vision of things, where things were going to go, and he couldn't take it. Apparently, he went in person to Paul VI and explained the situation, that he couldn't hold it together, and he could see the danger. And Paul VI calmly just replied to him, stay where you are. But he became aware of it. And he was actually himself trying indirectly to influence it before it got out of hand. He was publishing discreetly things here and there, and he was aware of specific dangers like the introduction of modern means of communication, which from the inside were going to be like Trojan horses. So the thing at that point already was becoming ambiguous. The reason is this. Going back to the Desert Fathers, the monastic life is a block, a tout qui tient, a whole that holds together. It functions when it's taken in its integrity, and each part of it is part of that whole. One big part of it in the Benedictine life, in the at least the Cistercian mode of it, is manual work. Now, manual work in the monastic life, going back to the desert, is not just remunerative, is not just a pastime, and especially is not just a recreation. It's actually a continuation of what has happened in church. And in the East, still to this day, if you look at them, as you can actually now on YouTube, any clip of a monk on Mount Athos painting an icon or working in an orchard, picking fruit, olives, and so on, look carefully at his lips. They are moving without ceasing. They are repeating, repeating, repeating the prayer of Jesus. Now that's going straight back to the desert with that pure Eastern tradition which they have of coherence and awareness of their heritage. C'est un tout qui tient. Which means, therefore, that they are perfectly aware that there is no break that this command of St. Paul, pray without ceasing, is taken seriously in the monastic life, going back to the origins, because the whole ethos of the work in the desert was deliberately simple and therefore liberating, so that the mind and therefore the prayer and the heart was going upwards and not outwards or inwards into the work done. That's therefore not just a practice, but if you like, a monastic theology. All this is in view of what? Creating on earth souls who have only one thing to do, the vertical, pray without ceasing. Now, those who were grounded in this, in France, in that severe discipline of the Trappist life up till then, were fully aware of what was involved in bringing in, initially, brief communications and what was going to follow. I make a jump. When I was in college, that was again that same year, actually 1970. I spent the summer vacation, no, the Easter vacation, with 
a Trappist monastery near us in Wales. It's still there on an island called it. And I was enthralled. I was delighted to find what they had, the separation from the world on an island. Still getting up at quarter past three and so on. But I was horrified by two things. In chapter, on a Sunday, a colour television blaring forth for two hours. And in those five hours of manual work, two and a half in the morning and two and a half in the evening, all the time, chit chat. I thought to myself, even though I was only young, I could see there is a problem here. What is the point of leaving the world to find it again in the monastery? Either we're serious or we're not. I'm a young man, and I'm going to find somewhere where I can do what I believe in. It's all or nothing. It's not worth it. We're wasting the church's time. I can preach better than talk in recreation become work. And so I went to La Trappe. That's the background to it. But it's something that you want to be aware of. I have no idea what's going on in your monastery, so I'm neutral. I'm only giving you, if you like, monastic theology. This question of the sanctity of monastic work, specifically, is an issue. It's a chunk of your life. It's not recreation. At that point, you have to be what you are, just as much as you are in choir. Therefore, you choose work which enables you to do that. Some work has to be done which disfavors it. Some have to do the practical. In fact, the Trappist sign for the procurator was, I think, that. It was the active one. And he was always having to do work for the others to liberate them. Also, certain types of works in responsibility involving correspondence and even perhaps now messages on computer, it's a bit distracting. But if it's done in silence, there is no need for a huge break or a change of mode. It's after all done for the Lord, and in the Lord's will it is blessed and has its grace. What is not blessed or graced is when we freely just engage without blessing or permission. So that's enough for today, but it's kind of important because if we really find that we're not doing what the church is asking us to do, Lord also is not free to bless us. You watch, if you are coherent, honouring the Lord on every level, you won't need a huge vocations drive, you won't need to publish a lot of leaflets, you'll find the Lord will do it for you. Those houses which are deliberately ignoring where they've come from, we'll find out that the Lord is unable to bless them. So we leave it at that. And we can turn it off. And if you ask, are there any questions, will be less formal. The light fair light was gentle night, thy tiny flame more comes the night, but bravely on tis nearly day. The light of lights is on his way. How strange this dance, this restless play. Each fight, each flicker seems to say, Behold how slowly I must die, My life I burn, my impulse nigh. How echoes thy not on word, my used heart her tone has heard. Thy work is done a candle bright. Thy flame has melted into light. O noble sacrifice indeed. O lesson for the world to heed. Thou teachest me, O martyr sweet. My life to lose in light and heat. All hail, great light, celestial ray, O Christ, thou art the break of day. At last this darkened eyes may see the dawn of immortality. Lord, when this flame is wholly spent, and shadows bathe once more this tent, in peace may we at thy behest Go forth and leave thy radiance rest. Amen.
under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, I, David Jones, firmly resolve to follow in the footsteps of my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ all the days of my life. Therefore, in the presence of Bishop Michael Smith, pastor of this diocese, of the saints whose relics are here present, and of all the people of God here assembled, I vow to you, Almighty God, to observe poverty, chastity, and obedience, according to the norms of the canons of the Church that regulate the eremitic life, and to offer myself as a living sacrifice of praise in the hidden life of loving adoration, for your glory and the salvation of humankind.